On the global political chessboard, what is very interesting is that many people can clearly identify the pawns, but nearly all overlook the bishop. And some in the dark, dirty world of politics believe that the bishop is a pawn. Example, the Pope. The Pope was in Mexico. Do you know that? Did Desiree know, right? He said negative things about me because the Mexican government convinced him that Trump is not a good guy because I want to have a strong border. I want to stop illegal immigration. And the Pope just made a statement. Can you imagine? I just got a call. As I'm walking up here, they said, Mr. Trump, the Pope made a statement about you. I said, the Pope? <laughs> what did the Pope say? I like the Pope. I mean, was it good or bad? Because if it's good, I like the Pope. If it's bad, I don't like the Pope. You said you believe that the Pope is being used as a pawn by the Mexican government. Do you really believe that Pope Francis would allow himself to be used as a pawn? I do. I think what happened is he was there. He was with the Mexican leadership, and they said, what a terrible guy Donald Trump is because he wants to build a wall and he wants to seal off the border. As to whether I'm a pawn, well, maybe. I don't know. I'll leave that up to your judgment and that of the people. A contentious exchange of words took place between 2016 U.S. presidential nominee and Republican billionaire Donald Trump and Pope Francis I. Why did this conflict provoke a media storm and how will it affect US and world politics? There are some key factors that should be noted when any individual is running for the president and it is not democracy. If these are overlooked by any candidate, then it is highly unlikely they will win the presidency. You have to take into consideration the self-interest of the military-industrial complex, the giant corporations and trusts that make up Wall Street and the Catholic vote. The late Avram Manhattan was one of the very few Western intellectuals to be aware of this and he knew that's what clinched a nominee his ticket in to the Oval Office. Avram Manhattan said that towards the end of the last century, Big business felt strong enough to buy no longer politicians or sets of politicians, but the presidency itself. In North America, it was the Rockefellers and the Carnegies, rather than Presidents Grant or Hayes, who in 1870 to 1880 ran the United States. North America has been attacked by political Catholicism although this has not come out into the open as an official or even semi-official political party. The omens, however, are there. The Catholic vote is already a serious political reality. So in the 19th century, Scottish-born American billionaire and steel magnate Andrew Carnegie and the richest American who ever lived that boosted the oil industry, John D. Rockefeller Sr. controlled the US government. And Archbishop John Hughes of New York was the first to use the Catholic vote by rallying the Irish as a united political unit. Donald Trump is a supporter of the US war efforts, so he will be a key ally of the military industrial complex. When five young African Americans were falsely convicted of raping a white woman in Central Park in New York, it was Donald Trump who was the most zealous of getting these young men convicted when he pushed for the reintroduction of the death penalty in New York. So just say for argument's sake he was to win the presidency, he will be continuing US foreign policy. But as brazen as he is, he will need the Roman Catholic vote. And he started to carefully back down on his challenge to the Pope when the corporate controlled media who supports the Pope started to subtly pressure him. She was just asking about a tweet that you sent out a couple of years ago saying how respectful you were of the Pope, how much you admired oh, him, and that Absolutely. now he's smacking you upside the head. Well, look, I do respect the Pope, and uh, certainly I respect the position. And it's not really his fault. The Mexican leadership does not want to stop a lot of things from coming over the border. But you're still respectful of the Pope? Can totally we say respectful, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. You've been in fights with a lot of people, but in, with the Pope, I mean, does it give you pause? 
I don't like fighting with the Pope, actually. Uh, I, I don't think this is a fight. I think he said something much softer than was originally reported by the media. I think that he heard one side of the story, which is probably by the Mexican government. Uh, he didn't see the tremendous strain that, you know, the border is causing us with respect to illegal immigration. A staggering papal denunciation, and it came after a week of Francis in Mexico again and again preaching a highly charged political message. Like those scenes in Juarez, a few feet from the U.S. border, Francis giving his blessing across the Rio Grande to undocumented immigrants in the U.S., and then demanding that more be done for all desperate migrants. The Pope is not going to come out directly and challenge any specific statement by any specific politician, but it would be surprising if he didn't say something about the, about his feeling that the United States should be more open to supporting uh, immigration and to supporting Latin, uh, Latin American immigration in particular. Why would the Pope in the middle of the U.S. 2016 elections bless undocumented immigrants when immigration is one of the most contentious issues in U.S. foreign policy? Illegal immigration and harboring immigrants is a felon, a crime under U.S. law. But the Pope, like his two predecessors, is stoking the fire and encouraging churches to break U.S. law for sinister geopolitical reasons. And he knows full well that he will never be challenged. This man is a troublemaker. And there is a reason why a Latin American Pope has an interest in the Mexican-American border. Let us get a background to this heated, contentious issue. In the year 2006, a film was released titled Apocalypto about the Mayan empire of Central America in Mexico. The Mayans did do human sacrifice, both on its captives in war and on some of its inhabitants. But the film was a clever way of distorting and bleaching the horrors that the Spanish committed on the natives of that country. And it was done by a Roman Catholic called Mel Gibson. Historians and film reviewers blasted it for its blatant fabrication of history. The Roman Catholic Church gave its full support and papal blessing to the most successful naval and military power of the church, Spain. And Hernan Cortes went on a rampage of pillage and murder, all for the exploration of gold and for the expansion of papal power. And the indigenous population in Mexico, though fearless warriors, were defeated by the Spanish conquistadors. The last Aztec ruler in Mexico was tortured and executed by the Spanish under Cortes. And the Spanish introduced that horrific inquisition into that country. But though under Spanish rule, there has always been a resistance to the Catholic Church. Benito Juarez, a 19th century Mexican national hero, a full-blooded Zapotec Amerindian who became Mexico's first indigenous leader, was a Mexican statesman and president for four to five times of Mexico, who championed the natives' rights and his liberal reforms that were embodied in the new constitution of 1857, reduced the political and financial power of the Roman Catholic Church where it championed the raising and living standards of the rural poor. The constitution was restored by Jose Carranza Garza, one of the main leaders of the Mexican Revolution, with the Mexican constitution of 1917 that also reduced clerical control. And Pluto Elias Carlos enforced it, reducing the Catholic Church's power in Mexico that fueled the Catholic-driven war in Mexico, the Cristeros War from 1926 to 1929, that both Catholic and most blinded liberal historians influenced by her have called an attack against the Catholic Church, and made a film that portrays the Catholic Church as a victim of persecution under the Calais government. But is that what really took place? Or is there another side to history? Our Manhattan specialized in the papacy's war on humanity 
and documented what the war was really about. In the middle of the decade immediately following the first world conflict, that is 1926, President Calles, after much procrastination, enforced the Carranza Constitution, which had been adopted as far back as 1917. By doing so, he struck at the two most powerful elements which, up to then, had dominated the life of the nation. The Catholic Church, the wealthiest single institution in the land, and the big American oil corporations, which owned more of Mexico's productive industry than did the entire Mexican population. The enforcement of the constitution meant, for the former, the radical separation of church and state, limitation of absurd religious privileges, withdrawal of the Catholic quasi-monopoly of education, reduction of ecclesiastical wealth. For the latter, expropriation and public ownership of the Mexican subsoil. The Vatican unhesitantly declared an all-out war on the Mexican government. Not the whole of the USA, however, was so easily deceived by American Catholicism's war mongering. Mexico did not establish diplomatic relations with the Vatican until 1992 and former Mexican President Vincent Fox strengthened relations with the late Pope John Paul II. But now there is a heated border conflict between Mexico and the United States. Poverty has driven people to flee Iberia or Latin America into the United States, and this has caused a deep tension between the two nations. And as the majority of those who are flooding into the borders are Roman Catholic, the Vatican is exploiting this situation under the guise of humanitarianism that will also create a racial tension, for the white population in North America is greatly dwindling in number, and the Hispanic population is expanding, and Pope Francis I knows full well that they are a weapon that cannot be ignored, who can be used to influence the political direction of North America. In a book published in 2004 titled The American Catholic Voter, when reading an excerpt, you clearly understand why Pope Francis I has visited the Americas twice within the space of six months. It reads that Hispanics may soon comprise the Catholic Church's largest ethnic group in the United States. If so, they will also be one of the nation's most significant voting blocs. These Hispanics, of whom 8% are Catholic, are becoming a political force just as the European Catholics were in the 19th and 20th centuries. One third of these Hispanics live in California, while most of the others reside in Texas, New York, Florida, Illinois and New Jersey. When the Pope beatified a member of the Inquisition who tortured Native Americans, and when he blesses Mexicans on the border, it was cleverly under the guise of humanitarianism, but it was really to boost the Roman Catholic presence in North America that will influence the 2016 US elections. There are those who can see, but they are too afraid to speak out and say something. The papacy is always overlooked and bypassed when looking at geopolitics. Many focus on the intelligence or the energy companies whose monopolies on every country on the planet expand on a daily basis. But these energy companies all work with papal Rome. Exxon Mobil Corp recently dispatched one of its senior lobbyists and a planning executive to Rome in an attempt to brief the Vatican on its outlook for energy markets. The mining industry has also paid a visit to the Pope to receive a blessing and a lot of American Catholic organizations having invested in energy companies, but many of these energy companies also bankrolled the papacy, such as the French Total and the Anglo-Dutch Shell that shows how deeply connected the merchants of the earth doing business with Rome. Oil giants such as Total and Shell 
and other companies operating in southern Italy's petroleum-rich Basilicata region footed the bill for this year's nativity scene in St. Peter's Square, according to the Catholic press in 2012. And Avram Manhattan gives us a reason why these oil corporations will finance the papacy. He said that the Vatican has billions of shares in the most powerful corporations such as Gulf Oil and Shell. Though the tentacles of this octopus is in every pie, her overall ecumenical strategy is to bring all of the churches under her auspice. When Pope Francis I met Patriarch Kirill, head of the Russian Orthodox Church in Havana in Cuba, it ended a 1,000 year rift known as the Great Schism and brought a closer union of the two churches. But what are the wide implications and where is it going? What was the aim or goal of this joint declaration? And was there any significance of this meeting taking place in front of a crucifix with a skull and bones, an iconic emblem that can be traced not to Freemasonry, but to the Papal Jesuits, of whom Pope Francis I is a member? Who knows? John Dalberg, better known as the Right Honourable Lord Acton, was an English Roman Catholic historian, politician and writer. Famous for that phrase, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. He was fiercely critical of his own church and made it very clear in his writings that anyone who supports the papacy supports tyranny. He said that the object of the Inquisition was not to combat sin, for sin was not judged by it unless accompanied by theological error nor even to put down error, for it punished untimely and unseemly remarks the same as blasphemy. Only unity. On the official website of the Vatican, it details the document that was signed and declares that its objective was unity, the principle of the Inquisition. A Swiss Protestant historian says that to understand the present, we must know the past. And if you do not know the past, you will not understand the present and the current trends in the world. And this is what gives Rome her advantage. She knows people are looking elsewhere. And this makes her more effective. But Avram Manhattan, who seems to have had more of an insight into the sinister moves of the papacy than most Protestant historians, documented in 1953 what this Vatican Orthodox Alliance entailed. To believe, therefore, that the enmity of the Catholic Church towards Protestantism is a thing of the past, or that the Catholic Church, while still waging war against her orthodox rival, is at peace with all other Christian denominations, is as unreal as to believe that she no longer considers herself the unique bearer of truth on all other credences heretical, mischievous and false. The largest diplomatic war in the history of man, which is still being fought as fiercely, as ruthlessly and as unscrupulously as ever. The goal of this thousand year war is simple, the destruction or subjugation of the Orthodox Church or its voluntary or forcible integration into the Catholic Church. The Tudor King, Henry VIII, though he remained a Catholic till the end, played a critical role in the Protestant Reformation in England. His son, King Edward, who was nicknamed the Young Josiah, after his father's death allowed the Reformation to spread in his short reign and the current head of the Catholic Church in England and Wales, Cardinal Nichols, knew why after 450 years a Catholic Mass was instituted in the very location that separated England from the papal controlled European continent, which is why it is still technically independent till this day. There is such a historic resonance about this moment, but in this place where so much of the 
impetus of the Reformation was, was created, was it provoked, I think now we can find ourselves side by side with a musical tradition that we share, I think is a great impetus to our Christian mission. A book titled A History of Conferences and Other Proceedings by Edward Cardwell, quoting from official authentic documents, describes the famous Hampton Court Conference where the Puritan John Reynolds, the head of the Corpus Christi College of Oxford University, recommended to the newly elected King of England, James Stuart, that the English people needed a new translation of the Bible. The King authorised it and appointed Richard Bancroft, the Archbishop of Canterbury, to appoint the 54 most skilled linguists in the country to translate the Bible. The famous poet William Shakespeare was not a part of the committee, though many conspiracy theorists assert so, though they don't give a shred of evidence to back up their view and their claims. But the Committee of Oxford, Cambridge and Westminster translated that Bible and presented the first copy to King James. And on the 400th anniversary in 2011, it is considered as a masterpiece of British prose and the epistle and dedicatory at the beginning of all the Bibles gives us an insight into the struggle it took to translate this Bible. It reads, Writing in defense of the truth, which has given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed, so that if, on the one side, we shall be traduced by popish persons at home or abroad, who therefore will malign us because we are poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people whom they desire still to keep in ignorance and darkness. What do they mean by that? The film V for Vendetta made a famous mark the most iconic emblem for global revolution replacing Che Guevara as the poster child. It was the face of the Roman Catholic terrorist Guy Fawkes, who tried to blow up Parliament with the entire monarchy in a parade. But he was a patsy. The real overseer of this terrorist act was a Jesuit priest, Henry Garnett, who confessed to his crimes that he blessed and oversaw the conspiracy. His official confession is in the top floor of the National Archives formerly known as the Public Record Office in London, England. And if you do not understand the past, you cannot understand the present. Hollywood will play a central role in programming the minds to accept globalism. The Pentagon assigns advisors to oversee scripts and are advisors on the sets of films and Phil Strubb, the entertainment liaison at the Department of Defense since 1989, approved scripts and provides the free military hardware to big blockbuster films. And these films will shape our attitudes to US foreign policy. Do you want to win the war on terror? Yes or no? This is the quintessential yes or no question of our time. Can they see us? Yes or no? But as all roads lead to Rome, she will take advantage of the euphoria of our time, knowing full well that no one will notice her. In 2011, she was not secret, but openly pushing for a one world government. And anyone criticizing the Pope, the Vatican has said is committing an act of terrorism. She has hooked up with the most powerful heads of the tech companies in the United States, who both work with each other, though they can at times fall out. But they monitor any form of radical thinking, and they are even trying to clamp down on free speech that even tech experts are saying is a bit dodgy. But the Pope is also encouraging that free speech should be limited, like his Jesuit forebears did when they controlled the Inquisition. And this is in line 
with the War on Terror Manifesto, where even school children's computer search is being monitored for radicalization. And when the Pope comes to Scotland in September 2016, he also wants to clamp down on the so-called radicalization of children, where he will oversee and sign an anti-extremism charter where leaders from different religions, diplomatic and community leaders will all gather in the Five Town in Scotland to sign a 10-point declaration to unite against radicalization. It is true when the late American educator Edward Alexander Sutherland said in 1900 that paganism moreover has but one model for all men. Its aim is ever to crush individuality and mould all characters alike. And that is why the Pope is pushing for all religions to unite and personal conscience should not be a part of an individual's faith for he sees that as a deviant form of religion that he labels as fundamentalism. What exactly is fundamentalism? It is a strict maintenance of traditional orthodox religious beliefs such as the inerrancy of scripture and literal acceptance of the creeds as fundamentals of Protestant Christianity, according to the Concise Oxford Dictionary. This is what the Jesuit Pope sees as his public enemy number one, those who believe in sola scriptura. And Donald Trump or any man who is looking to be president and become the commander and chief of the United States has to take all these things into consideration. I think that Pope Francis has played an extraordinarily, extraordinary role. He has been a voice of conscience all over the world. Let me really express my deep appreciation to Pope Francis. For if they are ignorant of a system that will never rest until it rules, then they will not win. Only those who will daily drink from the fountain of the Holy Scriptures will know how this whole drama will pan out. This is Asia McQueen from Even at the Doors giving an update of where we are in world affairs in the light of Bible prophecy. Keep staying tuned. Feel free to subscribe to the Even at the Doors YouTube channel where you'll receive regular videos. And you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter by clicking on the links below. I would just like to thank all those who have sent donations that have kept this ministry afloat. And if you would like to continue to support this work, also click on the link below. If you would like to see this work spread even further, you have permission to distribute this video for non-commercial or commercial use on the condition that you do not add or take away from the content of this study. Thank you.